Hello everyone, this is Ray Savage with Cambium Networks. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on advanced antenna alignment with uh, PTP 650 and our new PTP 700 product. Uh, the presentation is being recorded and a replay will be available uh, for replay on the Cambium Networks community. We'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward and also on YouTube. Uh, but if you do have any questions during the course of the presentation today, please use the question and answer dialog box on the right-hand side of your screen. Our presenter today is uh, Mr. Bob Shaw, who is the engineering manager for our U.S. federal market, and he'll be covering almost everything you need to know about PTP 650 and PTP 700. Bob? Bob, are you there? Uh, hello, Bob. Are you with us? Uh, just hang on a second. We will get this sorted out. Hello, Bob. Are you with us? Ray, can you hear me? Yeah, now we can. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I was having some headset trouble there. All right. We are ready to get started. Okay, well, good deal. If you can go back to the slides, I think, can you? Yep. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Well, good, good deal, and thank you, Ray. Thanks for, for, for the uh, introduction. Uh, and good morning to everyone, and, uh, and I appreciate the time that everyone's dedicated to this. Uh, it's uh, one of the uh, topics that I like to cover uh, when when we talk about troubleshooting, uh, there, there's a number of things that point-to-point -point networks that can apply through all point-to-point -point networks, uh, all microwave networks, and specifically 650 and 700 platforms for us at Cambium Networks. So the agenda that we're going to um, talk about here is is a little bit about uh, um, you know common installation problems. Uh, one of those is uh, high performance antenna alignment. Um, the 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 more gain you add to an antenna. Um, certainly the harder they can be to align sometimes. Uh, and then we'll certainly talk about some troubleshooting details afterwards, uh, after we cover alignment overall. So, Ray, if you want to switch the slide. Yep. Okay, so uh, when we talk about uh, antenna alignment, there are some key principles that are involved. And specifically, uh, there, you know, we live in a three-dimensional world. So there's two dimensions that are uh, can be changed when we're talking about antenna alignment, and that's your azimuth, or your left and your right, and your up and down tilt. Uh, those are your, in, your or your, uh, um, or your incline decline. Um, those two things can be changed. Generally, the distance of the link is static. Uh, we want to talk about both those things, and, and how do we, uh, how do we properly, uh, how do we, how do we properly uh, prepare for those? We're going to talk a little about antenna patterns. We'll talk about received signal strength and received power. Uh, we'll talk something about the X plus method, which is a way of really being very deterministic is when we're searching for uh, proper signal strength. And then we'll talk about something called the bullseye, which really kind of gives you a better idea, a functionally uh, mental picture of what we're trying to do. And then we'll talk a little bit about tactical or on the halt or in the field um, uh, type applications where we're aligning, but we haven't had time to do a complete past study yet, and we're trying to get things up and running. There might be emergency, there might be tactical response, there might be, uh, uh, that might be for emergency uh, fire, rescue, uh, police, etc. So we're going to go through all of those things. And, uh, and thank you, Ray. So on the, the next slide here we have, and this is slide three, uh, we're going to talk about compass declination. And, and what's declination? Well, declination is the difference between magnetic north and true north. And, and that's, that's a challenge that we, that we face. In some places, it's not, a, it's not a problem at all. If I'm sitting in Chicago, if I'm sitting in New Orleans, uh, my, my, uh, my magnetic bearing and my true bearing are pretty close to the same thing. There's very little declination or difference. Uh, but if I'm sitting in Clarence, New York, where I live, or in New York City, or South Texas, or Los Angeles, or Seattle, or Alaska, or Maine, or anywhere else in the world, generally there's a difference. And it can be significant. 
uh, in my house here, we've I'm actually 10.5 degrees off uh, our difference between what my compass would tell me and what I really should be shooting at. So we have to make some adjustments for that. And, uh, and you can see in, in red here that formula of a magnetic bearing, which is your compass bearing, um, is equal to your true bearing or the calculated bearing uh, minus declination. And declination can be either positive or negative, as you can see from just above there. Where I live, it's actually a west or negative declination. So in fact, I would actually be adding 10.5 degrees to my calculated bearing to come up with what the magnetic bearing should be and how I should point properly. And uh, so that's, that's what the formula is. If it was an east declination, it's positive, so we actually would minus it um, from that, uh, that, um, uh, that, that formula right there. And if you're looking to find out what your declination is, uh, NOAA, uh, NOAA, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, has a very nice website that actually allows you to do that. So, Ray, you want to flip? So just to give you an idea what that website looks like, anywhere in the world I can put in lats and longs, um, north or south, east or west. Um, I, can, uh, I can choose a date, normally be today's date when we're doing these kinds of things. And then and I can look up and calculate a, a bearing or a, or a declination. Um, in addition to that, if I don't know my, my lats and longs very close to each other, I can do it by zip code or I can do it by city and country. So if I was in the Bahamas, I could actually look up NASA, the Bahamas, and come up with an actual declination for that exact location. And they don't change much, but they can change over time. So uh, that, that value will actually come up. And if you can see on the far right side of, that, uh, of this slide, you'll see that's actually the resultant that you get from NOAA when you're getting your declination. And that's actually my house, literally underneath the star. So. Uh, um, it's just one of the things that we can use as a tool uh, to help us figure out how to point properly. Again, that's an east, um, or it's a uh, left or right, your azimuth, um, you know, your az azimuth bearing. So, Ray, if you could flip. So, one thing I've always found that I, I, I generally, I should own stock in this company. <laughs> it's a, it, it can be funny to say it this way, but Suwanto makes really great tools, and specifically, and specifically they make really, really great uh, compasses. And so the Suwanto tandem, which is actually, if you can see from the picture there, actually gives me a bearing um, east or west. It also has an inclinometer built on that will actually give me up and down tilts. So I can actually figure out what, what, my, uh, what my up and down tilts are on, on an antenna, uh, for example. Um, it's liquid filled, it's very precise, it's, it's very durable, and, and I've had one now for, I think I've had mine for probably 12 years. They haven't changed at all, and they're a really, really great tool. Um, there's others that are, that are available in the world, this happens to be my favorite. So, uh, next thing we talk about is uh, antenna up and down tilt, because of course we talked about left and right. If I'm, if I've, from an asthma standpoint, did, did I point left or right? Everyone thinks that that's a very, that that's generally your, uh, that's generally your problem area when it comes to pointing antennas properly, and sometimes that's true. You get up there on a tower, you get on the building, you think you're pointing to the right place, but you're really off because of what you're looking at from a landscape standpoint. But really, the most important and by far the most misunderstood is up and down, is, is up and down tilt. And I'm not sure if anybody in the background can put, put themselves in mute because I'm getting some static here. I don't think it's me. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, when it comes to an up and down tilt standpoint, uh, we think about things, and, and it's it's rather, rather simple concept. Um, all of you uh, remember from going to high school uh, or your graduate studies um, that, uh, that every angle uh, can, be, can, can be figured out with based upon, you know, in this particular case, point A, if I'm looking for my up and down tilt angle from point A, I need to know what the distance is and what the elevation change is. And then I can do an inverse tangent on that and come up with an actual value that's my actual up or down tilt. And it's, it's, tremendously, uh, I, it's, it's tremendously misunderstood. Uh, people will think, I've got 1,000 feet of elevation change and I've got 30 miles. You think 1,000 feet, 30 miles. Well, 30 miles is actually 158,000 feet. If you actually plotted that out in a triangle, um, that would be 1,000 feet by 158,000 feet, or if you reduced it, one feet tall by 158 feet tall, or reduce it even further, one inch by 158 inches. 
try to plot a triangle like that on your kitchen floor or in your conference room, and you'll find that that angle from point A is literally a razor and cannot be measured in the field. That's that's the real point of the. Hey, Bob, I think we've uh, lost you again. Hang on, everybody. We'll uh, get this sorted out. Yeah, there you are. Okay, is that any better, Ray? Yep, now you're back. Okay, good deal. I was talking away there, and uh, so, so apologies. So back to, I think, where we were. Uh, we were discussing up and down tilt. And again, this is by far the, uh, the, the hardest part. People do not generally get the, uh, get the geometry in their heads necessarily. And, and so when, when you say I've got an up and down tilt, or they're higher or they're lower at either end, there really is uh, where we really need, and I don't have any slides. Oh, there we are. Thank you, Ray. Uh, it, re it really, really is a, a question of perspective. And, uh, and, and like I said, you know, a thousand feet of up and down tilt may seem, or a thousand feet of, feet of elevation difference between two locations may seem like a lot, but over 30 miles, it's virtually nothing. And 0.36 degrees, as in this example, really cannot be measured. And if you look at that picture, uh, that's an example from Buenos Aires, Argentina, that uh, my, uh, myself and a, and a, and a co-worker uh, went to do an inst installation troubleshooting. And when we got there, it was clear that the antennas were out of alignment. And the customer, uh, the end customer, was, was adamant that his guys would not make a mistake and that the alignment was done properly. And when we got up to the rooftop, we could clearly see that the antenna was pointing to the sky. And they were certainly on a side road. And they, that we bought the antenna down, made it level, all of our problems went away. Um, it's, it's a real, real fundamental thing that if we can get our, if you think about it, if you can get your azimuth done properly within, within a degree or two and get your up and down cells done properly within a degree or two, you have a very, you have, you have fine tune alignment to do and you're not chasing uh, trying to chase a link that may or may not come in and may be acting very, very finicky or very inconsistently. And then that's something that we have to understand is that if the antennas are aligned improperly, we're going to get inconsistent behavior, which can many times be associated in your head with the radio when it's in fact really a physical issue with the links being aligned. So we can slip to the next slide. Right. So we think about it, we think about these uh, antenna patterns. This happens to be our integrated antenna uh, that we just saw in the last frame. That antenna has a very, very high gain down the center bore site. So if we're zero degrees off on our alignment, the antenna has very, very high gain. But as soon as you start wandering um, either side um, of, of that bore site or as, or as that prime spot, you will find that you start seeing nulls and then side lobes, and then deeper nulls and side lobes, and deeper nulls and side lobes. And they can extend all the way out to really pretty far off the side of the antenna. So we have to, we got to be considered, considerate of that and think about how do, I, how do I make sure that I'm aligned properly? And if you thought about it, if I was off by, let's say, 12 dB on, on an alignment, and one, one end was, was aligned perfectly, I could literally go to this antenna pattern and I could say, oh, okay, I'm off by X number of degrees, bring it back in. That, that would be true, uh, but unfortunately you don't really know uh, that and, and you don't always find that one end is perfect and one end is not. So um, we have to, we gotta consider these things. And then what you really also find is that someone will think, I'm on a side lobe, I'm down by 20 dB and it must be the radio. And I can tell you for a fact that since every one of our radios, every PTP650 and 700 that is manufactured, they each and every one of those goes through a, uh, a freeze test where they're, where they're brought down to minus 40 Celsius, and then they've got to work and pass a, number, a series of um, integration tests. Then they're baked up to plus 60 Celsius, and they go through those same testing. Each and every one of these radios does this out of the factory. They're already proven to work 
and can be calibrated at maximum temperature differences before they ever ship to you. So vastly, uh, you, you're going to find that if you're off by 20 degrees or 20 dB on your alignment, it is not because of the radio, and it is because generally because of the alignment or path calculation of something in the way that we didn't know about. So, ready? Next slide. Okay, so just to talk about antennas a little bit here, um, you can see this is uh, uh, one of my one of my uh, my cohorts in the RTM community actually created this slide for us a number of years ago, and it's really really nice to be able to show this. That if you look at an integrated antenna, which is which are very easy to use and very lightweight, you can throw it in your backpack, you can climb a tower with them. They're very very simple to use, and they're excellent for shorter lengths. But if you've got to do something where I need to have um, better isolation from interference or I need to have better uh, better gain for a link, um, either one of those high performance antennas become much more important. So you can see the integrated antenna um, on the top and then a two foot high performance antenna on the bottom and you can see that the gains are A, going to be higher on the, on the two foot antenna of course, but also the isolation from side lobes in other directions is also significant as well. So you get better isolation a better interference mitigation with something like this. So, so we'll talk more about that in the future as well. So how do I know that I'm going to get proper alignment? Well, we uh, one of the things we want to look for is we want to look to see what's our predicted received power. And when I look at predicted received power, I'm going to go to Link Planner, which I'm assuming many of you um, are very familiar with. And, and Ray has, uh, has done a number of webinars on Link Planner, and, and I'm sure certain that they're are additional materials available for that, but our link planner tool is an outstanding tool. I use it every day, and I can create very, very complex networks uh, and 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 um, and be able to plan out my links very, very specifically and, and to a high degree of accuracy. So when we look at the installation report out of link planner, it's going to give us um, everything from what my max transmit power is. It's going to give me my uh, what my uh, uh, my uh, predicted receive power is, my predicted link loss is. If I'm using something like the PTP 800, it's going to give me my uh, my BNC voltage because the ODUs on PTP 800 have uh, have the ability to put on a uh, voltage meter for alignment there as well. Um, both of those are all that stuff is found on an install report, and and it gives you your plus and minuses as well because you're all all RF fades as as all of you know. All radio frequency signals fade to some degree. And they can fade by polarization. They can fade by time. Uh, there, there's lots of different things that cause fading. So there will be pluses and minuses. But we're really, really looking to get to that value. In this particular case, I think you all see that my predicted number is minus 70 dBm. And at minus 70 dBm, I've got a plus or minus 5 that I can see. And when I'm looking for that, I want to make sure that it is there. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look for, we're going to look for that value when we do our alignments, and we really want to be right onto that spot there. Okay, so we'll, if you can hit the next slide, okay, cool. So uh, and where would we look? Where would we look? Well, this particular example shows the status page uh, for a PTP 600 link. So PTP 600, PTP 650, 700, and 800 all look and act the same in a lot of ways. If you've done 600 before, you certainly can do. Um, and that, in that, in that regard, really, 400 and 500, uh, 300, 400 and 500 older discontinued products, uh, all of those um, products um, really had the same look and feel, especially from the status page and what we're looking for from a received power standpoint. So when I'm looking at received power on a link, and I'm looking and I'm logged into that radio at my end or the other end, um, for that matter. I'm going to look, I'm going to, uh, if you look at the lower left-hand side of the screen, you'll see where it says status page refresh period. You're going to set that to a small value, like three, four, five seconds, so that the page is refreshing properly. And then we're going to look at, on the right-hand side, we're going to look at receive power, the receive power line. Many of you may be familiar with the way this looks. I've got four columns. The four columns, red, left, to right, are going to be maximum, mean, minimum and latest or last refresh of the page. So when I'm logged in, I'm looking, my eye goes directly to receive power line, far right hand number. That's what I'm getting right now. So I can say, Ray, align the antenna one degree left. And then I can see within a few seconds what that result's going to be. So I can see that tracking right along. Uh, once the link is installed and running for a very long period of time, I want to see that receive power line to be very, very similar 
across all those numbers. But in the very beginning, you may see wide disparity of values. But the right-hand number is the one we're looking at all the time. Okay. So, Rafe, and uh, there's one other place that uh, we do show uh, receive power, and that is also um, what we call the graphical install page. It's under installation, and in this particular case, this is on the P2B 700 link that I set up, and um, you can go to this page, and you'll see the number, and you'll see the number 83. What does that mean? And if you see the, the bar, you see the, the graphic value there, the bar is green. Bar is green means the link is up. If the bar is, if there's a bar, but it's red, means the link is acquiring, but it has not yet, uh, it is not yet actually uh, registering and acquiring, but it has not actually connected. So that you can, when you're seeing, if you saw an 83 number in a red bar, we would actually expect something, some sort of a configuration error that's causing us to be able to see receive signal strength, but not be able to actually connect. So just from a troubleshooting standpoint. Uh, now, what's this number mean? Okay, um, the graphical install value is actually equal to the number 120 plus your received power. So if you did the math on this, you say 100 plus minus 37 equals 83. So that's where that number comes from. It's really meant to be intuitive for someone who doesn't uh, is not familiar with the decimal system, that they can actually say, okay, more is better, taller the number is better, but if you're actually looking for a value to check against your install report, that's where you come with the number from. You would take 100 plus the receive power number. Receive power is, of course, always negative. So, right? Okay. Um, on the P2B 800, as I mentioned earlier, it has a BNC connection on there. Uh, so we actually have an analog receive power reading that comes out of that BNC connector, and you can put a voltmeter on there. And Pasternak and other companies um, sell little adapters, um, so you can go from banana clip to BNC, plug that onto your fluke or, or other voltage meter, and you can get to the exact value. So your tower climber has the ability to um, use that value instead of having to call down to the bottom of the tower when someone's logged in. Um, uh, with a laptop. Of course, the PTP 600, 650, and 700 all do still have an audible alignment tone um, that is useful for that tower climber as well. So they can use that to get the basic alignment done. Um, same thing as on the 800, we're using a BNC voltage meter. Is that right? Okay. So where would we get these values from? Uh, the values um, that we'd be looking for um, are in two places. One is um, these values are on uh, or in uh, the link planner install report. Uh, but if you also wanted to go and look somewhere else for which your RSSI voltages are a comparison to your voltmeter, um, you could actually go to the PTB 800 user's guide and it will, there are tables there that will give you what the associated value will be based upon bandwidth um, and, 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 and RSL or RSSI values. Sorry. Okay. Cool. So now let's uh, let's talk about this just for a second here. Um, we've we talked about a few things. We've talked about um, how do I figure out how to do uh, my my bearing on this link, and we know that if we plotted these correctly uh, in Link Planner or come up with some other way to find out what my bearings are, my true bearings are, my true north bearings, uh, we can then take and find out what the declination is in my location. We can adjust for declination to come up with a a, a uh, a uh, left, right, or azimuth bearing that will get me pretty close. So I use my compass to get pretty close um, on my azimuth, and then I use my uh, I check my declination or my declination for that, and then I check my up and down tilt or my inclination. That's also in Link Planner, by the way, and uh, and I make sure that my up and down up and down tilt on my antennas is done properly. Generally, pretty close to level, but uh, you can have some up and down tilt. And we want to make sure we adjust for that if it's appropriate. Uh, and um, and that may get us relatively close. But now I want to take and look at what my calculated receive power number is. Then I'm going to look at my measured number. And if they're the same, my my alignment is done. I don't have to do anything more because the values meet the calculated numbers. Um, if there's a difference or there's missing receive power, I have to figure out how do I get from where I am to where I want to go. And, and, and that can be a challenge because we, we cannot see radio waves. We do not have special glasses that show us where the signal strength is coming from. 
but we do have the ability to measure signal strength, and that's what the radio gives us, is the ability to measure signal strength. So we're going to have to do some sort of a systematic grid search that will allow us to be able to search um, around where we're pointing to get exactly dead on on our alignment. And it's something that um, people have, can have a lot of, lot of hard time with, and you spend a lot of money, and you, and you spend a lot of hours, and your crew is sitting out there, and you're saying, why isn't it coming in? Why isn't it coming in? It's not always intuitive. So what we want to really, really do is make sure that we do something very systematic so that we're cutting down the amount of time we're spending, saving money, saving the install time, uh, depending on where you are. If it's a, if it's a hostile environment, we, 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 want, we want to get our guys down safely and quickly. Um, if it's, if it's uh, otherwise, in a commercial environment, it may be that it's, it's raining, it's snowing, it's hot, it's cold, it's storming. Uh, all kinds of things can be happening. We want to really, really, really um, lower the amount of time we spend um, doing alignment and get it done properly. That's where this grid search or X plus method counts. So once we've got the antenna up there and we're pointing in the right direction, I would like to be able to mark my azimuth and mark my elevation at both ends. So my climbers can always go back and put the antenna in the exact same orientation. I can always reproduce my work. I can reproduce my work and start over. And from there, we really want to do a very, very systematic search. When we talk about this, we talk about X, because I've marked, I basically put an X, just like a treasure map. I put an X on the map, I put an X on my mounting uh, that says, here's my bearing, here's my bearing, here's my up and down tilt. Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to search left and right. I'm going to search by about two or three degrees either way, left and right, but I'm going to do it in very small increments. So I'm going to start out with going left from center, and I'm going to, and I'm going to change my, my, uh, my asthma bearing by just a small turn, just a half a degree at most. We're going to measure the signal strength. Does it go up or down? And we're going to go through this, and we're going to go out two or three degrees um, at a half a degree at a time, and it just needs to be for 30, 40 seconds each and every position. So we move a little bit. We let it settle, we measure. We move a little bit, we settle, we measure. We move a little bit, we settle, we measure. And if we go all the way left, three degrees, and we go, we haven't changed, we've gotten a lot worse, let's go back, go back to X. Now we're going to go repeat, we're going to go to the right. We're going to do the exact same thing. So I'm going to go back to that X bearing that I know I, I went to, and I'm going to say, all right, now I'm going to go right by just half a degree, then another half a degree another half a degree, and I'm going to work my way out that two or three degrees to the right. Now what I've done is, if I find that the value hasn't changed at all, or the value is, is dropping wildly, what I know is, is that the signal strength um, and, my, and, and proper alignment is not on that horizontal plane. So I need to change my horizontal plane. So now I'll change my up and down tilt by just, say, half a degree. One degree maximum on my up and down tilt. So I'll move up so it's x plus 1. I'm going up by just 1 degree, and then I'm going to repeat my left and right markings and my left and right values, or my left and right position moves, um, 2 or 3 degrees left, two, back to x, 2 or 3 degrees right. And by doing that, I'm actually taking slices. Just as if you, were, if you think about the old black and white TVs, they all had scan lines in them. So the, the TV was actually written in a scan line, so you actually uh, you know, it actually, you know, lit up the screen, went down one line, lit up the screen, went down one line, lit up the screen. Same kind of thing. Or even if you're trying to slice an apple. If you didn't know where the core of the apple was, you could start slicing until you got to the core. And you would have a very deterministic way to say, okay, apple, 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 ah, finally at the core. It's the same kind of a concept here. I'm really trying to take out horizontal slices and make sure that the signal strength I'm looking for is not there. And if I go X and it's not on the X line, and then I go x plus 1, and it's not there. I go x plus 2, it's not there. Maybe x plus 3, now I'm up, now I'm up 2 or 3 degrees on my, uh, on my up and down tilt. If it's not there, I go back to x, and I go x minus 1. And I can track this and find my optimal signal strength within a short period of time. And that's the idea behind this whole thing, is even if you're pointing... Uh, even if, if the other end is pointing improperly, you're still going to be able to focus in on their energy um, so your end is aligned on it properly, and then you have them repeat at their end. We should be able to, in just two, you know, 
my end first, your end second, and be done with this in a short period of time. That's what the X-plus method does for us here. Okay. So, Ray, if you could flip there. So, why, why do we care about this? Well, because you think about it and you look at this graphic. Right? If I was at X, and if I just did a left and a right, I could have good signal strength, good signal strength, drop into a null, come back out of the null, um, onto another side lobe, have less but some signal strength, and then walk my way out. I could go back to X and maybe go uh, the other direction, go to the right, go right into a huge null, really, really deep, lose complete signal strength, keep coming and get more signal strength again, and you can see that that red line shows you you're back on the same side lobe. This is a pretty common issue that people uh, and, and uh, installers will go left and right, left and right, left and right. They'll find the side lobe they're on, that they're on twice, and then they'll go up and down, and up and down, up and down, but they'll be on the same side lobe. They'll go into the nulls, and they'll come back out, and they'll come up, and they'll be on the same side lobe, and they will sit and track basically in a square value um, or in a square pattern. They'll go left and right, up and down, left and right, up and down, and they will find that they will not get that sweet spot and it, it can take a tremendous amount of time and be very, very frustrating. So if it's sunny, it's hot, it's windy, it's cold, it's rainy, it's snowy, it's never going to be perfect conditions to be able to do antenna alignments, and, and, you're, and, and people get frustrated. And instead, what we want to do is, again, be very deterministic. I want to take that red line, and I'm going to measure left and right on that red line, and I'm going to move the red line up one and measure, up again and measure. And if, I'm, if I don't find what I'm looking for, I bring that line back down to X, and I go down one and measure, down one and measure. In this particular case, you can see that if I went up, went up three values on, on my elevation, I'd get horrible signal strength. Go back to X, X minus one gives me better, X minus two, I'm dead on. If I keep going to X minus three, I'd actually be going the other way again, and I'd be losing signal strength. So I can actually track to exactly where my... Um, my center beam is and get my alignment done very, very quickly. So before I pass, um, I'm going to, before I slide, Ray, can go back one slide? Um, just before I um, move on to this, are there any questions so far on the stuff that I talked about? Well, Bob, we don't have any in the, in the queue right now. Okay. Well, good. Good, good, good. Um, so with that, with that said, the, the bullseye, this, this, this one thing, that graphic really explains to a lot of people. Some people are really good about how the X-plus method and explaining that, and other people need to see a graphic. The graphic really is something that really, really is a telling sign. It's almost like you're trying, when you're doing a 10 alignment, I'm trying to fire a bullet at each end and have those bullets hit each other midair. I want them to be exactly on the exact same path. That's what I'm trying to accomplish. And so that center lobe um, is really wanting to line up at each end and the graphic shows you how you can easily be on a side lobe. And in fact, there's, there have been many times when I've sat at an installation and been at, been at that X value and you start tracking and you start moving your, your azimuth and you might go 5 or even 10 degrees depending on the antenna type and the value virtually doesn't change. It's because you're on this very large side lobe um, that exists in three dimensions. So that, that's the, this, this here helps a lot of people lots of times. That I've, I've had people look at me strangely and they can't understand what I'm really talking about when I talk about the X plus method of a, they doing a grid search, but then when I show them the graphic, they go, ah, I get it. So um, use, this, use, the, use this screen because it really, really does make a difference, especially for people who are not familiar with microwave technology and haven't done a lot of installs in the past. This really makes their lives a lot faster, a lot easier. So, if um, you can, next slide. So, uh, another question that, that does come up, though, is what about space diversity? Uh, we, we all, or many of you know, that PTP 600, 650, and 700 um, allow for space diversity right out of the box. There are two antenna connectors on those radios. And, in fact, um, I can have a dual pole antenna, as if on the picture on the left, um, and I could have two single pole antennas, and that's the graphic portion on the right. Um, and if I've got space diversity at one end or both ends, how do I align those? And the answer is, you would start with one polarity at each end. So my, top, my, my climber on the, or my installer that's on my left, he would connect the vertical polarity only, 
to the antenna, and then he would, oh, and and on the right side, you know, location B there, um, they would connect just one antenna, and that would have that would be the antenna with the vertical polarity, and they would align those antennas with the X plus method exactly as we talked about, and they would be able to get within 3 dB of the calculated number. And then once they did that, then the, uh, the people on, generally, the people on the right-hand side of this picture, location B, they would go and now attach their horizontal antenna to the radio, and then they would align their end to get within the exact calculated number. But in general, if you're doing space diversity, you know, one pole at a time, the first polarity, you need to get it within 3 dB. So we double our power by using two polarities at once. So, um, uh, just uh, what about tactical installations? What if I need to get something done very, very quickly? A very good friend of mine, uh, you can only see a quarter of his head in the, in the right-hand side picture, but we, did a, we, we, had, a, we had to do a, a very, very quick install uh, at the NATO summit in 2012 in Chicago. And he called me, I was cutting my grass. And, I, and literally on Saturday, cutting my grass, my phone rings, and I answer the phone, and it's my buddy, and he says, listen, we really need to get um, this install done, and, and we're having all this trouble on our network, and can you help us? So I went into my house, I packed up a set of radios, um, configured them for him, and shipped them out on a transit case. Um, on Monday morning, um, they got, he, got, he got his radios. Um, by Monday afternoon, he had everything set up, and we walked through the X plus method, and he had the, had them installed and ready to go, and everything was perfect within within a couple hours. So really, really quick tactical deployments are possible if you just have a little bit of familiarity with them. So next slide, please. So um, and these here's another example of where I might have a tactical or quick install. Um, this happens to be a White Sands missile range in uh, in New Mexico, and we were shooting at this particular particular point, I think 63 miles. And we didn't have coordinates. We weren't told ahead of time what our locations were. We just knew that we were going to shoot a PTV 800, which is the radio on the left or the one that's in the pickup truck bed. Uh, you can see it's the same thing. Or And, and also I had a PTV 600 radio, which is the one in the foreground on the right-hand side picture. We're going we're gonna to shoot these links and we're going to measure and see what they can get. They want to do a real-world test based on the kind of jobs that they did. And then they do testing all the time where they really don't know where they're going to go. They just know they've got vertical assets and that they've got, they can do these long distance links. So we set the links up. We, we turned all the radios on. We figured out more or less what our distance was. And then we came up with received signal strength, um, a, a very quick calculation for signal strength um, that will allow us to align the antennas properly. So, Ray? So before we, when we, if we talk about how do I figure out very quickly, uh, antenna signal strength. How do, how do I, if I don't have a link planner file made, I don't have path loss already run, I don't have some other tool that says to me, this is what my signal strength should be for this link based on this transmit power and these antennas, how do I find it? Well, it's actually not that hard. So we'll go through this um, for you. Uh, we have a couple rules. There's rules of 3, 6, and 10. Uh, as most of you are probably familiar, um, we have 3 dB is equal to two times your power. If you have 3 dB more, you have twice the power. If you lose 3 dB, if you're off by 3 dB, you have half your power. Same thing as if you went to the bank and someone said to you, I've got you, Bob, you've got $100 in your checking account, and, um, and I'm going to take 3 dB away from it. Well, if we, if we measure dollars with like we did DBs, I'd be down by 50 bucks. Right? I'd only have $50 less. And if that same person says, I'm going to give you 3 dB to your bank account, instead of having $100, I'd have $200. So pretty cool um, the way that all works out. 10 dB is similar. 10 dB of gain or, or, or gaining 10 dB means I've got 10 times more power than I had before. If I lose 10 dB, I have a tenth of the power that I started with. So being off by 10 dB is actually pretty big. And you got to remember that when you're doing your installs, we want to be dead on because we don't want to be down by half our power or by a tenth to a tenth of our power. And then the other thing, uh, the rule, of the, the last part of this rule is, is 6. 6 dB doubles my distance at the same modulation. So if I was told that I needed to move my link that was 10 miles long and to another location and, and I needed to provide the same uh, throughput, but it was 20 miles um, what, and it was 20 miles long, I would have to add six more dB of gain 
to my system to get the exact same result. Right? I hope that makes sense to everybody. Um, and if I and, and if I was going to cut the distance in half, I could lose 6 dB and still get the same results. Okay. And then of course the decibel system is an additive system. If I've got if I'm down 40 dB, that's the same thing as being 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10. But when we, we equate that back to the to the digital world, that means we're actually dividing by 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. So if I if I'm if I have 40 dB of loss on my link, I've reduced my power to one ten thousandth of the original signal strength. Just keep keep that in mind. So then just the way the numbers work. And if you can um Thanks, Ray. So now, how do I how do I uh, how do I figure out what my loss is for a link? In this particular case, I'm going to do a four gigahertz link. Um, that's that's a NATO band, so it's for federal government use. But um, the numbers are, are similar for other frequencies as well. And um, and there's a couple constants that we know. We know specifically that uh, for the first mile line of sight, I'm going to lose 110 dB. I'm going to have 110 dB of path loss on my link between two ends um, once I start transmitting. And if I want to double my distance, I'm going to lose 6 dB every time I double my distance. So if we look at the, on the left-hand side, you see first mile, I have 110 dB of loss. If I go two miles, it's 116 dB of loss. If it's four miles, 122, eight miles, 128, 16 miles, 134, etc. And you guys can get the math on that. So you can see how the longer the distance is, the more loss I have. But it's not linear. Again, it's exponential. So Ray? So now, in addition to that, when we talk about losses, we talk about loss, especially in the microwave world. What if I have some non-line of sight loss? Okay? Um, we know line of sight I can calculate very, very quickly. Non-line of sight is a little bit different. If I put something in, the, in, in my path, I'm going to have some amount of loss for that. And that loss is going to um, be equated to, again, what's in the way. So if you look at the, in, on the graphics uh, towards the bottom there, if I've got, let's say I've got four or five or six trees in the way, I might have 20 dB of loss. That means I'm down to one one hundredth of my original signal strength, or what it should have been. If I've got a whole tree stand in the way, or a ridge of trees, it could be 30 dB. A lot of bait. Um, and obviously, when you get you know big buildings and stuff like that in the way, urban canyons or even mountains in the way, it's 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 dB uh, of loss. So you've got to be able to equate what's in the way uh, with with some some amount of loss profile, how much attenuation you're going to have. Is that right? Okay. So how do I calculate received power in the field? If I was out at White Sands Missile Range and I needed to come up with a number so I could tell the guys at the far end mountain, hey. You need to make sure that you're you're aligned properly. That we're going to get X amount of signal strength. Well, what's what's that number? How do I know what that is? And and basically, it's adding your gains and losses. That's really how this come, we come up with this. I take my total link loss, which is my free space or line of sight loss, and any excess path loss, which we just talked about in trees and things. Add those together. I take my transmit power. Um, which is my max transmit power the radio is set for, and generally when you're in arm mode, um, that's what you're transmitting at. You're going to take your in antenna gains, and in this particular example, I'm using four foot radio waves, dual polarity dishes, in four, four gigahertz. Uh, of course, that's the example for here, and those are 32.4 dBi. And then lastly, I've got to attach my radio to my antennas, so I have some RF cable. That RF cable has a loss. Uh, we happen to sell something called Andrew Superflex, and we have a three-meter cable that we sell um, quite a bit of uh, that connects our, our our outdoor unit or ODU to to the antenna, and they generally have about one dB of loss um, at each end of the link. And so I add these up, and these are positives and negatives. Uh, obviously, loss is a negative; it's a negative 137. My transmit power is a gain. My antennas, those are both gains, and then of course my cable loss again is a loss. When you add those things up. The resultant is you receive signal strength. That's how much I should have when I'm aligning my antennas properly. And in this particular example, I should have minus um, 47 dB, 47.2. And if you, you if you gave me minus 48 or if you gave me minus um, 46, I'm pretty happy about that because there are going to be a little bits of variation along the way. RF fades positively and negatively. So um, we may see positive multipath, we may see negative multipath. 
which could affect that number a little bit, um, therefore my plus and minuses, but I'm generally going to want to be right dead on in that value if I can, as long as my conditions are good to let me make that work. So, Ray? Okay. So, um, so we just, we just, just, to can, just to wrap this portion up, um, we've talked about how do I align my antennas, how do I get my azimuth right properly, how do I get my up and down tilt done properly, how do I do my fine tuning with the X plus method, talked a little bit about um, the graphic uh, and, and the bullseye and how to give, give people an idea in their head of what they're really, really looking at. Uh, we did talk about space diversity a little bit and how we align antennas for, uh, with space diversity. Um, we talked about tactical installs. Uh, tactical installs might, again, that might be a, a test range at White Sands Missile Range, or that may be um, in Houston uh, for the city of Houston for a 911 response, or that may be um, for uh, uh, National Guard deployments um, or things like that. Any first responder type applications where I'm really trying to set things up quickly, how do I get them done quickly and, and, and not, too, not too complex? And all the stuff we talked about kind of covers that. Um, so I want to give you a sneak peek on something that we're going to be introducing shortly, and I want to formally introduce you um, or invite you to a webinar that we are having. I know that Ray is handling the, the invites, but we are having a webinar on January 27th, and it's going to introduce something called Cambium Network's Quick Deploy, Quick Deploy Positioners. And, and uh, that, that's something that um, we have not offered ourselves directly in the past, and this is new for us, and, and rather, rather, rather exciting. So, Ray, if you could flip. Okay. Um, what, what is a positioner? And if you look at the right-hand picture, it kind of gives you an idea. We have an automatic antenna alignment applications. This, this allows me to be able to go set equipment up, turn it on, and instead of doing any alignment, I can actually have auto alignment happen so that my first responder, my National Guard um, uh, 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 soldier, my, or, or, or whichever guard that they're in, um, air response, uh, public safety, um, anybody from NATO or the UN or Department of Defense or Ministry of Defense, um, oil and gas, anything like that where I, I've got to move things on a fairly consistent basis or set up in an emergency situation, I don't have to align my antennas anymore at all. The alignment this alignment system will actually do the entire thing for me. It's a mechanical system that's automatic and, and allows me to have a high degree of accuracy on alignment and get it done really, really quickly. And so you've got to look at it and you say to yourself, would, would this be good for me? It, and, and the answer is when I have applications where people are not generally uh, very, very familiar with antenna alignment, this can really, really pay for itself in a very short period of time. Um, so in all the applications that are there, you know, cellular on wheels, you can think of the NFL um, and, and think of uh, the Super Bowl and, and, and think of uh, the, 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 the really that, that awesome um, Alabama Clemson game the other night. I mean, being able to get additional capabilities to a place or something big rather quickly without having to be an RF person can make this kind of a, this, this kind of a device really, really integral to any solution that people are asking for. And it's, the cost is not astronomical um, and significantly less than, I'm not going to talk about cost, but significantly less than some of the solutions we've had in the past. It makes it much more affordable. So it's really, really something exciting for us. Uh, one note, the very bottom bullet point, the Quick Deploy 25 and the Quick Deploy 50, which are the two, the two uh, models that we are introducing, 25-pound uh, payload, 50-pound payload, they are not for true mobility. They're not maritime at sea, and they're not for larger antennas, larger than two-foot antennas. Uh, this is a uh, this is a on-the-halt um, application, and it's not for continuous usage where you're tracking a remote site uh, 24 by 7. It's really meant for those um, fast deploy, set it up, align it, have it done, and then stay static for a period of time, then move on and go somewhere else. Great, if you can flip. Okay, so uh, just to give you an idea what the solution contains, um, obviously the, our Cambium radio is a separate product purchase, but the quick, uh, quick deploy positioner actually comes as a kit. And I know that uh, uh, Bruce Collins, who's our product manager for this product, will discuss that in detail on January 27th on the webinar, uh, but it does include things like the positioner um, and some basic mounting and it, and it does include um, cables and power supplies and controller. 
Uh, and it's a rather, rather slimmed down, really, really nice version of what we've had for in the past. And it is compatible with PTP 650, 700, the PTP, PTP 450i, and also 450i subscribers as well. And again, this is just a sneak peek for you guys to talk about um, if I've really got applications where I, I don't have experience climbers all the time or I, I have where uh, uh, quick deployment is really, really key from a time standpoint, this can really fit into a lot of your solutions. Is that right? All right. So now let's just talk a little bit about uh, antenna, not antenna alignment, but troubleshooting. In the troubleshooting world, in the troubleshooting world, uh, PTP 650 and 700, you can break them down into a few different pieces, right? First of all, access to the radio. I've got it on the bench. Can I talk to it? Second thing, is it configured properly? Could they talk to each other if conditions were right? And then third thing, what are my RF conditions, my radio frequency issues, signal strength, distortion, interference, cable faults, and, and antennas? Those are your generally your, your big basic ones. There's lots of little things we could spend time on and, uh, and generally when I teach the two-day training course that I offer, uh, it generally uh, is troubleshooting is, is, is multiple hours long, but this gives us a lot of the basic things that can get you up and running rather, rather quickly. Uh, so first thing, can I talk to the radio? For, I, I sit in, uh, in training classes, uh, I've since Ray introduced me, I am the federal engineering manager. I normally teach for federal customers um, as generally large systems integrators, uh, VARs uh, focused on the uh, federal space and also federal end users. Uh, when I teach my classes, I generally do a two-day hands-on class for those kinds of customers. And when I do that class, we normally spend at least an hour, if not two, just troubleshooting people's laptops. Can I? And the first question I always ask, can you ping it? All right, the devices have default IP addresses, 169.254.1.1 or 1.2, depending on the model. Um, they've always got a 255.255.00 subnet mask. Okay? And, uh, and then, you know, my very, people tell me all the time, I can't log into it. Can you ping it? That's the very first question. Let's take the complexity out of this and really get us down a layer one, layer two. So can you ping it? If you can't ping it, well, let's start looking at IP addresses. Do I have the proper IP address? Am I in the same right network and with the right subnet mask? Um, those two things are, are important. Um, there's also Windows Auto Configure. Um, generally, people will understand that's, that we have and we use a static IP address on all these radios. And so DHCP, or requesting an address for your laptop or your computer from the network, isn't going to work. We're not going to get one because it's a static, it's a closed network. You're talking directly to a device, so we we need to be able to go set an IP address for for your for your uh, your laptop with a proper subnet. Um, of course, Windows Auto Configure does work some of the times, but it also adds a lot of confusion for people because Windows Windows Auto Configure will give you after about a minute you ready your your laptop will time out and it'll say I don't have an address. It'll create an address that's a one six nine two five four something dot something address. And if you did an IP config on your on, uh, on a DOS prompt, your Ethernet adapter would actually say state that it has auto configure address. You can see the little black box on the bottom there. Mine says IP V4 address. I've got mine set specifically to 169.254.1.98. If you if you had not set one yourself, you would see that it would say uh, Windows auto configure IP4 address, and it would say 169.254 something dot something. And yeah, you can talk to a default IP address radio, or a radio that's been defaulted. Um, that, that does work, but it's inconsistent because Windows has to time out every time you do anything uh, to be able to give you that address again. So it can make for frustration. Another thing you run into, of course, is, is security been configured. By default, out of the box, the radio does not have security configured. If you're going to add security, you need AES, an AES license. And if you, if you have that AES license turned on, you can then set up a secure web server. Now, once it's been set up, it's no longer HTTP. It's HTTPS to get logged in. You guys all understand that, I'm sure. Um, next thing, firewalls. Do I have my firewalls turned on? And do I have a proxy server set on my Internet Explorer or Firefox? If you've got proxies set, 
you're not going to be able to talk to the radio directly. Those are also challenges that we have to try to get rid of. And those also count when we talk about um, throughput testing. If you're trying to do throughput testing, even with an iPerp or JPerp or something like that, you got to make sure that those things are turned off. And then lastly, one of the things that I always use when I get the installs and when I'm doing things is I look at the powered indoor unit. The powered indoor unit power supply that comes with the 650 and 700, at least the enhanced power supply, uh, 650 700, um, it has an Ethernet light on there that when you power up, within 30 or 40 seconds, it's going to blink slowly 10 times. It's not Ethernet traffic. That's actually signaling saying that the radio has received power past all its internal diagnostics and is signaling back down the cable that it's ready to go. Right? And that's actually done on pins 4, 5, 7, and 8, by the way. So you could still have Ethernet faults in your cable and that, and that would still blink slowly 10 times. But that tells me that I'm actually doing it properly if I saw it blink slowly double blinking 10 times. So blink, 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 blink. Saw so that happen 10 times that would actually mean the radio is in recovery. And I can bet you so many people that, uh, that are on the line have probably heard that in the past. So Ray, on slip. So now, what if I can't get in? I don't understand. I, I, I've got the right IP address, and, and maybe I can even ping it, um, or maybe I can't ping it, and I don't know how this radio is configured. Someone else had it before me. Um, I'm, I'm completely confused. How do I solve this problem? Well, this, there's something actually called recovery. And recovery mode allows us be able to get into the radio and basically reset um, security, uh, reset IP address and Ethernet configuration, or erase everything. And I'm not going to cover recovery full on here because it, it can take just 10 minutes by itself to walk through everything. Um, but, it's a, but it's very cool that you can, in fact, if you have physical access to the radio, you can get into that radio and you can erase everything and start over again. You're not locked out completely. And one thing to mention uh, is that uh, of the options that you get with recovery, you, there's something called erase configuration. That's your last resort. You don't need to press erase configuration unless you really think you've made a mess of everything and you really want to start out um, differently. And even then, it's really your last resort. Uh, there's other ways around um, configuration changes and configuration issues, and I, I, don't, I don't remember what I changed, and, and I don't know what the default should be. There's, there's other ways to get to there. So when, when in recovery, last resort is the erase configuration. Use reset security, reset IP, be able to get back into that radio and talk to it. Right? Um, so anyway, uh, with that said, uh, radio configuration. If I've got to configure the radio, what has to match at both ends to make the link work? A um, couple things. Software version, region code or regulatory domain, um, AES over the air encryption key. That's an option, but if it doesn't, if you've got AES turned on and if they don't match, the link will never come up. Okay? Uh, com capacity license keys must match, so I can't have a light and a full. And lastly, all of your installation wizard parameters must match, and that's specifically all of your RF installation parameters as well. So, Ray? Okay. So if I'm looking for a software version, where do I find it? I log into the radio, and you can see that on the status page, left-hand side, software version will be listed right there, plain as day. You want those to always be matching. Will they sometimes work? Will a .9 talk to 1.0? Will a 1.1 talk to 1.0? Possible, but you may get quirky, quirky behavior to the same one all the time. So next. And then regulatory band or region code. Um, if I'm looking uh, to set up a radio, and this is generally done and controlled through our license keys, depending on country that we're installing with. In this particular example, I've got a USA Federal, which is a wide open band, really meant for expeditionary usage for our DOD. Uh, in this particular case, I've got USA Federal. If I had one set up as USA Federal and one set up as a you know, USA 5.8 um, frequency radio, they're not going to talk to each other. So I've got to make sure my regulatory bands are the same. And again, that's controlled with the license key. Um, and of course, regulatory band support, if you, when you log into your radio on your installation wizard, you'll actually see all of the things that that radio supports and all of the frequencies that it supports that you got licensed when you created your license key. And then where am I going to set those? 
course, again, I set those under wireless configuration under installation. And if I'm, I can choose which one of these I want to operate in. And both 650 and 700 are wideband radios, so they can have many of these. In this particular case, I've got a whole bucket of them that the, the PTP 700 can do. 650 has uh, similar kinds of things. 650 can go from 4.9 up to 6050 megahertz. And, and that's, a, that's a pretty wideband radio. There's lots of regulatory bands that are out there for that. Right? Okay. Um, AES encryption can be done on the configuration page and also it can be done on the security page. Um, both places are, are you're able to set your AES encryption. And they must match for both key length. As you can see, you've got the uh, third line up from the bottom says encrypt, uh, encryption algorithm, none, AES-128 or AES-256. You're going to want to make sure that you, you set them the same, obviously, and the keys match as well. Now, capacity. Capacity, of course, is also found under installation, um, and you can see where your regulatory domains are and also what your, your, your capacity is. We do have the ability to buy light radios and, and, and have demo, 60-day um, demo full licenses with those as well. Um, they still have to match no matter what. Uh, installation wizard is where all of my RF parameters are going to be done. Um, there's other things that are set with installation, but this is the RF side. And on the RF side, uh, we obviously we want to make sure we go through and everything matches. Um, lower center frequencies, critical that they always match. Um, I've got to have my channel bandwidth that's always got to match. Um, link optimization doesn't necessarily have to match, but you'll get an error otherwise. Ranging mode has to match, etc. Color codes are something that generally I tell most of my customers, don't mess with unless you, know, so you really know what you're doing. So I always want to leave those as default as well. So, okay. And then uh, receive signal strength. Where do we find that? Of course, back to the same screen um, that we looked at before. I've got a PTB 700, or this is a 600, obviously. Uh, but I'm looking at the receive power line, looking at the far right hand side. If I'm looking at distortion, because signals can be, even though they're received, can be distorted. The more distorted they are, the less modulation I can get, and therefore the less throughput I can get. So vector error is something that we use. Vector error defines distortion. And vector error is a measure of, as it says, error. I want less error. And in the decibel world, more negative is less. So I want to have a more negative number. And I can tell you, for example, that I had a customer um, up in Canada, had links for five years. He always wondered how he could get rid of his minus 30 vector error. After five years of flawless work, he comes to one of my classes. We sit there and we talk. We get the vector error. He says, how do I get rid of my vector error? It's minus 30. I can't believe it's so bad. And I said, remember, it's a measure of error, not, um, uh, it's a measure, it's, it is a measure of error, so more negative is better. You don't want zero. You don't want 7.2. You want minus 30, minus 35. So the more negative, the better your link is. The higher the uh, the higher the modulation will be, the better your throughput will be. Okay, um, diagnostics plotter is another place we can measure this. And uh, for many of you who've seen diagnostics plotter before, it allows us to track a number of different variables for 31 days. We want to make sure that that. We don't want to see up and down. We would like to see really, really flat, straight lines. That means I've got a very solid install that's been properly designed and properly in implemented. Um, that, that's what I look at. When I see very flat vector error, I know I've got a very, very high quality link. Um, many of you know, if not, if not all of you know, that the PTP 650 and 700 have a built-in full-time spectrum analyzer. We actually analyze the spectrum around, depending on the link, around 1,200 times per second. And we can actually set it up to scan the entire spectrum um, that we're operating within. So you could actually look, and even though your radio might be set up, maybe you've got a PTP 650 that's set up at 4.9 gigahertz, um, you actually have uh, the ability to look and see what else is out there on the frequency range. Say, oh, well, 4.9 is a little congested. What if I move to 5.1? It's completely clear. Uh, and if your customer is amiable to that, that may be something that you might be able to do. Uh, and all of this data is available to you through the, through the GUI and also through SNMP. And we track every channel for 25 hours. Now, spectrum management also we give some additional things. This is spectrum expert is different than old spectrum manager um, or management. And it gives me a number of different things all at once now. 
So not only can I have a zoom in on the upper left there, you can see the actual spectrum of my, uh, of my link and what I'm seeing, where I'm, the green shaded area where I'm operating in, as well as all of the interference that I might be seeing around me. Not only am I just seeing that, but I can actually look in the upper right and see per channel 25 hours of history on that channel. On the lower left, I'm actually getting a waterfall view, which is 25 hours comparing all the channels combined. So I see some channels that bright orange, that's high interference. Yellower, still interference. Yellow and blue, it's waff they're waffling back and forth between interference and non-interference conditions. And lastly, the all blue, those are frequencies that are staying clean and, and are certainly more usable. So we can actually look at those and see what we're really seeing not only from right now, but also uh, what we've been seeing across the entire spectrum uh, for 25 hours. So it really gives me an additional avenue uh, and dimension that we didn't have before, even in our radios um, in the past. The PTV 600 was hallmark for spectrum analyzers in this industry, and, and this adds significant capabilities to that. So, right? Okay. Some tuning notes we want to think about when we're talking about um, DSO or, or uh, uh, spectrum optimization, we want to talk about interference threshold. That's when would I change a channel if I if if, if I was set to be dynamic. Um, what about hopping margin, hopping period? Those actually say those actually say when do I move to a better channel if one exists? That's a proactive method of changing channels. Um, do we have ex extended spectrum scanning on? Do we have real time spectrum scanning on right now? Those kinds of things from a viewing standpoint, and then also asymmetric DSO. Asymmetric DSO allows the radios at both ends of the link to be able to optimize either end. So let's say Ray's end, channel one is perfect, but at my end, channel nine is the best channel. If we've set up asymmetric DSO to be enabled, that allows me to transmit to Ray on channel one, he can transmit to me on channel nine, so we can actually split frequency. And that allows us to be able to tune around local noise. Okay, physical cable faults, and thanks again for everybody because we're running a little bit late here, but uh, uh, physical cable faults. If I've got Ethernet cable faults, how would I know? If I'm losing packets um, on, on the Ethernet cabling between my outdoor unit and my Ethernet switch or my camera, et cetera, where would they be? Well, I can't tell you what happens when I transmit an R, or I cannot tell you what happens when I transmit an Ethernet frame down the wire, but I can tell you what I see being received on my Ethernet port. And this is, this is key here, that under statistics and detailed counters, or in specifically on the 650-700 called main port counters, um, where we actually see CRCs, undersized, oversized fragments, and jabbers. We want to see those guys always be zero. Maybe one, two out of a billion we might, might lose, and that might be because a cable getting plugged in or not. We otherwise want those values always to be zero. And we check that at either end of the link, check that for each radio to make sure that we're not losing anything um, at each end. Uh, on the statistics page, you also get Ethernet bridging and wireless availability and a byte error ratio. If I'm really, really looking for the highest quality links, I certainly want 10 to the minus 6 or better. That's my, really my minimum. And if I'm really, really talking about um, carrier grade quality, I'm going to shoot for really 10 to the minus 9 or better. And they certainly are capability. We have the capability of doing those things properly configured, properly designed. And then it also the last thing, or one of the last things, is that if I've got uh, a, an issue between the outdoor unit and the antenna itself and those RF cables, and vastly RF cables, it's not the cable that goes bad, it's the ends that go bad, um, either because the cable's been installed and it's loose and it's, and it's, it's um, jittering back and forth in the wind, or because the stainless steel on those connectors is not as good as it should be, and they start to oxidize or rust. And in which case, I can actually see signal strength difference between the cables, and that's called signal strength ratio. It's on the statistics page. It's also on diagnostics plotter, and that's um, on all 600, 650, and 700 series radios. And uh, you can see the values there, they should be around zero. If I've got a dB or two either way, I'm not so concerned. I see 10, 12, 15, 20, I have cable fault and I have cable failure. So if I see a plus value, because signal strength ratio is actually V over H, if it's a plus value, significant plus value, that means that my, uh, that um, 
uh, that my vertical is stronger than my horizontal, which means I've got a problem in the horizontal cables. If I see a very negative number, let's say minus 20, that would actually mean that my vertical cable is at fault and my horizontal cable is much stronger by, say, 20 dB. So those are values we want to take a look at. And we want to consistently look at those over time to make sure they stay pretty close to zero. Okay. Diagnostics plotter gives me 31 days of tracking for things like that. In this particular example, you can see that this link has been running for 21 plus days and it's got a plus 10 dB signal strength. I've got a cable fault in there. I'm losing 10 dB on my horizontal. I'm 10 dB stronger on the vertical because it's a plus value. I, I really would want to troubleshoot that. That would be something that I would have concern over. Okay. Um, transmit, and one other thing that comes up that's lots of times people say, I'm getting intermittent, um, uh, intermittent behavior, don't understand why the link is going down, what's going on. And I say to you, we're going to go back and we're going to look at the power page. So on our system, and then the reboot page, if I go to the reboot page, um, I will actually be able to pull down and actually see the last 10 times the radio is rebooted. And if you actually set your time server up, any user reboots will actually say um, the actual time and date that you actually um, had those reboots. Um, the short power cycle is how we get the radio into recovery, um, and a long power cycle means the radio's been down for more than five seconds. So now when we look at this, if I saw 10 entries in a row on that page, and they all said long power cycle, or all said 10 short power cycles, I'm going, I've got, I've got an intermittent power problem. You know, I've got power plant issues at that site. And that's going to solve a lot of your problems where say, okay, it's intermittent, but, the, but if it's not on, that, that generates the whole problem. Okay. Um, example of the deployed systems, of course, you can see Link Planner allows me to um, map out systems. So I can actually go and look at, uh, at what my links might look like. And um, and just one more time, Ray, because I think there you go. Um, so we actually did a comparison because uh, I talked about antennas earlier a little bit, just proper antennas and using proper antennas, integrated antennas on a, on a specific link. Um, they're using 45 megahertz of spectrum, or spectrum is utilized, 15 megahertz channels. They need 40 megabits of aggregate throughput, but the reliability of five nines was relatively low at one megabits, and a lot of it had to do with negative 78 noise floor. If you look at the right-hand side, same exact link, same exact radios, but I'm using a two-foot high-performance antenna. It drops my, um, drops my uh, or raises my overall aggregate throughput significantly and also raises my five nines number tremendously from one megabit to 15 megabits, making it much more usable um, for this particular customer, even in a high interference environment, minus 78. So he was able to use the link where before the integrated antennas, he was unable to use the link. So using proper antennas really does matter. And thinking, what, what am I trying to accomplish? Where am I going to install? If it's really, really rural, lots of times we don't have to worry about it. But, uh, but when we're in urban environments, antennas really do count. Okay. And then one of the last things I always really, really try to stress is that how do I save my work? Once the link is running and, or been bench tested and I know everything is right, it's been on the bench, they're talking to each other, I can pass traffic, I can log into each end, I can do everything I want to do, it's exactly as I want it, I now want to go to System, Configuration, Save and Restore, and then Save the File. Um, and, and you can see that we save the file based on MAC address and IP address. You can edit that with Notepad and, uh, and, and change it to whatever kind of file name you'd like it to be. just have to make sure your extension is still CFG because uh, we're looking for a CFG file. One note, and additionally on Save and Restore, if I save a configuration in a particular version of software, let's say my software version is 1.0, and then I upgrade to 1.1, I need to resave that configuration file to the new software version. Software versions and configs have to match exactly. Okay. Okay. And if all else fails, and you're really, really stuck, and you really don't know what to do, and you call our support team, or you call me, uh, one of the first things you're going to be asked for is your field diagnostic files. And if you use that URL in that first bullet right there, once, you, once you've already logged in, you will, it will take you to a hidden page where you can download a snapshot of the radio. It does not include security. There's no passwords. There's no other security stored in this. But it does completely save your configuration as well as the history 
things like spectrum management or spectrum, the DSO pages, your, your DSO history, as well as your diagnostics plotter history. So we can actually get a look to see what's going on on your link and look at it in an offline manner. So any of your RTMs would use this as well. Um, and with that, I think that really does wrap up everything that I want to talk about. Well, Bob, we, we did have one question that came in. Have you got a second? Ray, we still there? Yeah. Yeah, the uh, question came in from a network operator. He's using an integrated antenna, and he asks, what can be the causes to have a big okay. difference? Well, I think it, um, I'm hoping that everyone, uh, uh, everyone has been able to hear me and be able to get something out of this. I know I went pretty fast, and it went a little bit over an hour. Um, a lot of stuff to cover. If you have, a, if you have other questions, you know, please reach out to us. Uh, I know that the community forum is a, is a really good place to get, uh, to sh get and share um, all the things that, that we can do for you. And hopefully okay. we'll in the future. Thanks, Bob. Bob, can you hear me? Hello, Bob?